I want to say a few words about where the multi-agent systems paradigm comes from, that is how we've ended up studying these things that we call multi-agent systems. Now, students often assume, kind of naively, that new scientific developments, things like programming languages and programming paradigms, kind of emerge spontaneously, that somebody wakes up one morning with a good idea and that that's how things happen, but of course that's not how they happen. Uh, they emerge from, typically from, ideas that are prevalent at the time, and trends that are prevalent at the time, and multi-agent systems are no exception. So what I'm going to argue is that multi-agent systems arise from five trends that have been ongoing throughout the history of computing to date, and those trends are towards ubiquity, interconnection, intelligence, delegation, and human orientation. So let me say a little bit about each of those trends in turn. So the first one, ubiquity. When something's ubiquitous, it just means it's everywhere. And when we talk about ubiquitous computing, we mean computer processing power everywhere, in every technological artifact that we construct. And this ubiquity uh, that we're seeing, the increasing spread of computer processing power into devices and places that we wouldn't have imagined putting them a few years ago, is happening for a number of reasons, but most importantly, it's happening because of things like Moore's Law. Moore's law tells us that the cost of computer processing power decreases year on year. Roughly speaking, it says something like the cost of computer processing power decreases by half every year, year on year, an exponential decrease in the cost. And it also says that uh, the size of computer processors and the amount of power that they require is going down steadily. So as a consequence of that, we're able to embed computer processing capability, information processing capability, into devices and into places that we couldn't have imagined even a few years ago. Okay, so that's ubiquity, the spread of computer processing power, embedding information processing capability into every technological artifact that we can imagine. The second trend is towards interconnection. So not just have we got these uh, uh, processes embedded within every device that we can imagine, they're able to communicate with one another. Okay? They're able to send messages, exchange data with one another. And there are similar trends like Moore's Law, which roughly say that the cost of sending a bit from one place to another uh, will decrease uh, in, in, over any given year period. So it's getting cheaper and cheaper to send data. The pipes down which we transmit data get wider. And that's the trend towards interconnection. It's most obvious at the growth of the internet over the last two decades, but it's also in, uh, evident in things like mobile phones, the fact that we now use mobile phones to transmit and receive data, digital data. The third trend uh, is not so much a technological trend. The first two, ubiquity, uh, interconnection, are very much technology push trends. Uh, intelligence is more of a sort of a, a pull trend, it's what we want computers to do. So here I have to be a little bit cautious about the word intelligence because of course there is a large area called artificial intelligence which is about constructing devices that are capable of human-like intelligence. And here I mean something slightly weaker. What I mean here is just the idea that the complexity of the tasks that we can get computers to perform grows steadily year on year. And unlike Moore's Law, this isn't an exponential growth. Okay? So the complexity of tasks that we are capable of automating and getting computers to solve for us grows steadily year on year. Okay, so that's intelligence. Delegation, this fourth trend, delegation, simply means that we're happy to hand over more and more parts of our lives every day more and more parts of our lives to computers and let computers handle those on our behalf. So the most extreme example of this is things like fly-by-wire aircraft. So uh, the idea of fly-by-wire aircraft is that you take a human out of the control loop and you put a computer there in place. So it's a computer ultimately controlling or piloting an aircraft. And when this idea of fly-by-wire aircraft became commonplace in the 1980s, it was actually extremely contentious. A lot of people were very uncomfortable with the idea of delegating this authority, this capability of flying a plane to an aircraft. Well, now we take it for granted, it happens all the time and we don't notice it. And I think most people would accept that, in fact, it's led to improvements uh, in air safety. 
Okay. Where are we going next? Next on the agenda, well, fly-by-wire cars or drive-by-wire cars. Okay. So we can imagine um, automated cruise control systems, automated braking systems in cars, where we begin to hand over more and more control of the car to a computer until ultimately we'll have computers driving those cars on our behalf. So delegation, the trend towards handing over control, delegating tasks to computers. And then the final trend is towards human orientation. And the idea here is that the way that we interact with computers becomes ever more like the way that we interact with people. So let's see why this is. It's most evident uh, if you look at the progression of developments in things like programming languages. So back in the 1950s, when the first real stored program computers were, uh, uh, were devised, the way that you programmed them was you had a row of switches. And the, the switch in this direction on, uh, in here meant there's a 1 in this bit of memory. And down here, if the switch was down here, it meant a 0 in this bit of memory. So you program the device by filling up memory by flicking switches in that way. Incredibly crude, incredibly primitive, not very productive. And so it didn't take long for people to figure out that there must be better, more efficient ways of people interacting with machines. So they started to develop programming languages that made it easier for people to program machines. So we saw machine code, uh, which then led into the idea of assembly language. The assembly language, one of the key ideas, that you didn't know exactly where everything was in memory. You didn't have to know where everything was in memory. Then in the 1950s, the idea of machine-independent programming languages, languages like COBOL, Fortran, Lisp, the early machine-independent programming languages, where you could learn a language on one machine, and then the programs that you wrote would work more or less without change on another machine. The idea of subroutines, labelling a section of code with a meaningful name, and being able to invoke that code by that meaningful name, making it easier for people to structure code which led into the idea of procedures and functions in languages like Algol and Pascal, into abstract data types, into the state of the art, objects. So let's pause for a moment and think about where the idea of objects, as in object-oriented programming, came from. Where did it come from? Well, people understood that when we interact with devices in the world around us, devices like this plug, this socket here, okay, we interact with them by doing things to them. So I press this switch this way, tells this device something. I press it the other way, it tells it something else. This is the interface of the de device, and what I can do with it is analogous to invoking a method in the object-oriented sense. And objects were supposed to reflect this idea of um, uh, devices with these well-defined interfaces that we could do things to, interact with in that way. And this was supposed to be a software analog of these real-world objects. Well, the world certainly is full of objects, but it's also full of agents, people like you and me, things like companies and governments, that are all not just waiting to have things done to them, to have methods invoked on them, but are all busy actively pursuing their own agendas by performing actions on their own behalf. Okay? So if we accept that the world is full of objects and a programming language should represent that, then perhaps also, if we want to reflect the reality of the world we're in, which is full of agents, like you and me and governments and companies, then perhaps we need analogues of agents in software as well. So we've seen these five trends. The trends toward ubiquity, computer processing power everywhere, interconnection, the idea that these processors can communicate with one another. Intelligence, they're capable of solving more and more complex tasks. Delegation, the idea that we hand over control to these things. And finally, human orientation, the way that we interact with them uh, more resembles the way that we interact with people. So that's the future of computing. Okay? I, I, I'm pretty sure that, and I think many other researchers would agree with me, that the future of computing looks like that. Ubiquity, interconnection, intelligence, delegation, human, -oriented, human orientation. So where is that leading us? Well, what I'm arguing is that leads us to something like multi-agent systems. 